How are you guys doing? Wonderful. Good, good. Sorry. I have a cough drop in my mouth. Makes it hard to speak. Well, I want to welcome you guys to Oikos. As we say every week, Oikos is our humble attempt to allow Jesus to carry us home, where we find rest and we'll be fresh for that work ahead. So we're continuing in our series, Messiah. We're continuing through this book of Revelation. And we're going to do a quick review of what we talked about last week. So last week we covered the first three verses. We essentially talked about the intro to the intro. And we took it down to three words. Three words for the whole um, book of Revelation. And we saw that it speaks of an urgency. It talks about this idea that Jesus could come back at any moment. That we need to be ready for his coming. We also talked about a walk. We discussed that we have to walk in integrity and righteousness. We have to daily check ourselves and check our heart. And we also talked about a promise. We saw that it says that this book, the book of Revelation, it has a blessing to all those who would read it. And so we saw with this whole idea of the book of Revelation and how he's calling us to read it, that there is a blessing for those who read it. We saw then that this book, it's not meant to mystify, but it's meant to clarify. It's for us. It's not against us. So we shouldn't be afraid. When someone mentions the book of Revelation, we shouldn't go back and fear, but we should embrace it. And we should move forward. Because when we see this book, essentially what's happening is, it's God showing us a picture of his great love for his church. And when you start to look at it in that way, it really trips you up. It really makes you go like... This is really interesting. Like, I never noticed how much he loves us. Because essentially what God is saying is, I love you so much that I'm going to turn the whole world around to come back and make things right. So that you and I can be together again. That's essentially what the book of Revelation is doing. And so we saw that the main idea that we walk away then from this book is worship. We walk away as worshipers of God not as prophecy scholars. And we said that we want the heart of the psalmist to be with us in our journey. We talked about Psalm 119, and we want this heart as we go through the book of Revelation. And remember, we mentioned that Psalm 119 says, open my eyes to the wonderful things, give me understandings to know your word. And so we said that that is the heart that we want as we go through this book. So why don't you go ahead and open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. So open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1 and let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray for our word tonight. Father in heaven, Lord, as we just come before you, we ask right now, Lord, that you send your Holy Spirit, Lord, to open up our eyes and our ears, our hearts to receive and to glean from your Holy Word. I just pray, Lord, that Anything that comes from me, Lord, is just burned away. And that what comes from your Holy Spirit is guarded in our hearts, Lord. That we're able to use it in our lives and in our daily walks. Jesus, your brightest listening, speak to her this night. We ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, you guys. So Revelation chapter 1, we're going to begin. We're going to be looking at verses 4 through 8 tonight. And we're going to look at verse 4 real fast. And verse 4 says the following. It says, this letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. So we see a little thing right there, right away off the bat. We see the first thing is, once again, John is telling us, right? I'm the author. I'm the one that wrote this. And notice how there's no last name. There's no son of. John needed no introduction. John needed no, like, oh, it's this John. When the churches got this letter, they knew that this was John, the final apostle of the Lamb. He was the only one left from the 12 apostles at this time. So everyone knew who this John went. This John was. So he's telling them, I, John, have penned this. And notice who he writes to. There's a specific audience. He writes to the seven churches in the province of Asia. So the question we have to ask ourselves right away off the bat is, why? Why these seven why these specific churches and why this number? And we see that 
as we read, we're going to get the answer. We're going to see that specifically the behavior of each of these churches and the way that the letters are written, it pretty much goes through the whole church history. So we see that reason for why these sevens. But we also see that number. We look at that number seven, and we see when it comes to the scripture, that number seven always means something. So it's always very important for us to go back to the original language and to go back to the word and see what is actually being said. Because it's so easy for us to just be like, oh, you know what? It's a seven. And we go on YouTube and we go on all these places and we start seeing all these videos and all these things about numbers. And then we get all these wacky, crazy conspiracies and theologies. You know, I've talked to individuals that told me like, oh, yeah, you know what? This means 666 or like the, for example, the mask right now. I remember watching this video of this pastor and he's saying, yeah, the mask is the mark of the beast. He's all like, because you got the word mark. But if you like twist the, like the R a little, it kind of forms an S and see mask. And I'm watching the video and I'm like, are you like kidding me right now? So it's so important that we go back to what the scripture says, because anyone can pick numbers and anything could be 666. You know, the other day I was like, oh my gosh, you know what I noticed? Bruce, who we love. Bruce could be the Antichrist, 666. And you're like, what? And think about it. Think about it. Looking at Bruce. Think about it. If you take the letters of the name Bruce, right? You get the numbers 2, 18, 21, 3, and 5, which is 49. There's five letters in the name Bruce. So then 49 times 5 gives you 245. We serve a triune God. So that's three. So 245 times three is 735. But God is holy. We are not, right? And we are, we, are, um, we are flesh and we are spirit. So we have that thing, that kind of balance, right? So you, you subtract then the flesh, you subtract 69 from that 735 and you get 666. <laughs> See, he could be the Antichrist. So this is what I mean. We got to be careful when it comes to numbers. When it comes to numbers, we go back. What does this say? What is this saying? Because we can make up any theory that we want. So we see, what does the Bible say about seven? Well, the Bible, like I mentioned earlier, it says it talks about completeness. We see there's seven days of creation. There's seven sayings on the cross. Seven I am statements from Jesus in the Gospel of John. There's seven sections to the Our Father prayer, to the Lord's Prayer. We see that David writes that God's word is perfect like gold refined seven times. It also, we also see that there's a sevenfold work of the Holy Spirit. And we see seven times Naaman had to dunk himself in the Jordan to be completely healed from that leprosy. So we see the number seven, the scripture tells us. You also go back to the Greek and you see that that word the is a definitive article. It's an all-inclusiveness. So this letter, is, it's for these seven churches, but it's also for all of us. This letter is also for us today. So if any of us in this room consider ourselves a church, consider ourselves believers, we need to be paying attention to what these letters say. We need to be paying attention to what this book says. So let's go on and it says, Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. From the sevenfold spirit before his throne. And from... Jesus Christ, he is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God, his father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. So we see the greeting essentially is more than a greeting, but we see that the greeting is a prayer. We see he starts off with the prayer. And we've talked about these two words, grace and peace. Right? Grace to the Gentile and then shalom to the Jew. Right? The greetings of both people. But not just that. We see in these two words, grace and peace. We see the fullness and the richness of the message of Christianity. Because Christianity, we see it's all about grace and peace. And if you go through the scriptures, you always notice these words are always in this order. It's always grace and then peace. Because we need to experience the grace of God. 
before we can experience not only his peace, but peace with them. Remember when we talked about the gospel? He saved us by himself, for himself, from himself. And so we need to remember that. That because of his grace, we now have peace with him. So we see then, his grace then is the unveiling of his glory. And this is something for you as young believers to understand. If you can fully understand what this word means. Because this word gets lost in translation. We start to put our own thoughts and we start to put our culture. Because you say the word grace and you think of elegance or eloquence. You think of, oh, you know what? That person's very graceful the way they walk. Or you know what? She speaks with such grace. But we see that this is not what it's saying here in the scripture. It's talking about the unmerited favor on you from the Lord. And what is that? We see he writes about it. He says, he goes on and he says, him who loves us. That is grace. That God loves you. Going back to Romans, looking at Paul's words. Paul, someone who understood what grace was. Look at what he writes. In Romans 5, 8, he says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And he goes on a couple verses ahead. And in verse 10 of this very same chapter, he says a verse that I, I love because it shows the reality of his grace for you and me. He takes it further than while we were sinners. And in verse 10 of Romans 5, he goes on and he says, For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, we were still his enemies. So think about that. While we were still his enemies, while we still chose to spit at the face of God, do our will before his will, he still sent Christ to die for us. That is what grace means. That is what we need to understand. Grace and peace. And you find this almost in every single epistle in the New Testament. Both letters of Peter, they speak of this. 2 Peter first 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Romans 1, 7, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 3, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. 2 Corinthians and so on, you look at all the Pauline epistles, grace and peace. You get to John and you know John, he always has to one up Peter. John has mercy. And it says, grace, mercy, and peace. But we always see this, grace and peace. And so it was really, as I was doing, um, just thinking about this idea, something that's always really hit me when it comes to reading the scriptures, especially reading the epistles. And I, I remember being a young Christian, and I've shared with you guys how I didn't really go to church, watching Ma Matthew movie and um, reading the Bible was my church. And I remember um, I graduated high school and then our vice principal got cancer. And I remember I wanted to write him a letter and I was trying and trying and trying and I would look at the epistles and I'm like, dude, these guys write so like nice. You know, oh, the heavenly God on his third throne, may his grace and his mercy and righteousness. And I'm trying, it got to the point, I kid you not, it got to the point that I gave up and I just copied, I think like Galatians or something. And I just... Change Paul's name to my name. Something like that. Hey, I was a little kid. I was like 19, 18 when I wrote this. And I was a baby Christian. I didn't know what I was doing. But it, it hit me though. Ever since I did, had that moment, it, it hit me with this idea of why don't people write like this anymore? Have you guys ever thought of that? Like, have you guys ever read older Bible preachers? Not just the epistles, but maybe like A.W. Tozer or like Charles Spurgeon, and you see these, <clears throat> excuse me, you see these guys and you're like, wow, like, these guys, it's just like, this is where I journal and like, this is where they're at. And there's just like something about the words that they use. And so why is that? Why is that that these individuals write this way? And I remember it's, I've had, like I said, I was 19 when I did this, so I've, I've had this question for like 20 years now. And it hit me on Monday. Where in the line at In-N-Out. We're getting lunch. Katie and I. And we're talking. And I 
kind of bring this up to her and I was telling her, do you ever notice this and this and that? And her response was kind of like my, what my response has been for like 20 years. We've gotten lazy. We're just lazy. We went from like all the these and the thous to emojis. Essentially is where our language is at now. So she's like, yeah, we've just gotten lazy is what it is. And then it finally hit me. You know what? It's more than that. It's more than we've gotten lazy. It's that these individuals, they understood who God was. And they understood this idea of grace and peace and what it meant for them in their lives. And that really convicted me. It made me really go like, oh, wow, that's like craziness, like to see this reality. Because here I was, angel thinking like, oh, you know what? I don't think I'm like that bad, but isn't that what we always do? Oh, I'm not that bad. But then this reality of like, dude, like they understood who their God was. You look at the Psalms. Most of the Psalms written by David, where was he at? Was he in the palace? Was he hanging out on the throne? He was in the wilderness, in caves. All he had was God. That's all he had. Look at Peter. Peter's one of my favorites because you see Peter in the Gospels, and he's like a guy's guy. And by that, I mean he's the guy that always likes to talk and put his foot in his mouth. He's the guy that, oh, we're going to do this, and then Jesus is like, yeah, no, come on. But then you see the epistles, and he goes from like, hey, no one's going to touch you, Lord, to... Oh, my heavenly children and my lovely lambs, I love you so much. And you see this change that happens in him. And we see it's because he understood his God. He understood what grace and peace was. Think about it. Peter knew what it was like to hang out with Jesus. He knew what it was like to walk with Jesus on the road. To have Jesus put his arm around you, smile at you and say, I love you, Peter. He knew what that was like. But he also knew what it was like when the pressures of the world come around you, how easy it is to deny him and how easy it'd be like, you know what? Not only do I not know him, but may there be a curse on me if I'm lying to you that I know him. I do not know also him. knew that. But we see the story didn't end there for Peter. We see after the resurrection, he encounters Christ once again and he encounters that grace and that peace. We look at Paul, same story. A murderer, he butchered the church. And it wasn't like, oh, well, you know what? This is like the last resort. This is what we have. No, no, this is, no, this is what we have to do. This is what we got to do. We got to butcher all these Christians. But we see he encounters Christ and what happens? He understands what grace and peace is. So the question for us tonight is, do we understand what grace and peace is? Do we understand what it means to encounter the living God? Because it's so sad for so many of us. We treat church like a party. We have the light show. We have the fog machine. We have the lasers. And then now I even notice that we have beach balls thrown around the audience during worship. And it's like, you're coming before the living God. You're not coming to a beach party. And so it's so sad because when you look at this, though, these individuals aren't doing this out of malice. They're just doing this to attract in people. They're trying to attract in people. But the sad part of this is what they're telling young people, this isn't enough. This isn't enough to hold your attention. We have to do all this for you because this has lost its power. It's essentially what they're saying. And it goes back to what we just said. It's losing what grace and peace is. And so I love that he starts with grace and peace and he then introduces us to the God that we worship, right? The triune God. He speaks of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what does he end it with? He ends it with all glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. But see, he talks about the Father, the I am, the ever existing one. It says that he was, is, and will be. He's the beginning and the end. We see that John presents us a timeless God, a God that will always be there no matter what. Then we see he talks about God the Spirit. Right? Some translations say the, the seven unfold spirit. Other translations say the seven spirits before the throne of God. But it's this idea of the Holy Spirit in his full completeness. In his complete work manifested. And we see that picture when we read this. 
We go back, our mind goes back to Exodus. Remember Exodus and when they built the tabernacle? What does God tell Moses? This is the model, this is the shadow of what is in heaven. And what does he have him do? Before the Holy of Holies, he has them build a seven-branch menorah. So we see that picture of the light of the Spirit, of the work of the Spirit. Isaiah 11 speaks of the sevenfold work of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, they speak of the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel, of might, the Spirit of knowledge, of fear of the Lord, talking about the Messiah and the work of the Messiah. And then we see, lastly, he introduces us then to Jesus Christ. And we see that it's usually... Father, Son, Holy Spirit is what the order that we see. But here we see that he shifts it. And he puts Jesus at the end because Jesus is the centerpiece. We talked about this last week. Jesus is the message of revelation. It's all about him. It's not about events. It's not about prophecy. It is about Jesus Christ. That's the whole reason we've titled this series Messiah. <laughs> and you know what's funny? I didn't even know that. The Holy Spirit knew that. I titled it Messiah because I wanted you guys to know the real Messiah instead of all these false messiahs. And I, I had thought of like doing this like a couple months ago, and it wasn't until I was going through this this week that it hit me. This is why we've titled this series Messiah, because it's all about him, because he alone is the true Messiah. We read in Acts 26, 23, it says, The Messiah would suffer and be the first to rise from the dead. In this way, announce God's light to the Jews and Gentiles alike. It is Jesus who reveals that light of God to you and me. And we see his threefold work here manifested in this prayer. We see first, he's the prophet. It says he's the faithful witness. In Deuteronomy 18.15, Moses tells the Jews, there's going to be another prophet that will rise like me. Listen to him. In John 12.49, Jesus says, I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. He was the faithful witness when he was here on earth. He spoke what the Father told him to speak. We see the second part of his work there. He's the firstborn of the dead. He's our great high priest. Hebrews 7, 25 to 28 says, Therefore he is able to once and forever to save those who come to him. Through him he lives forever, intercede with God on their behalf. And then it goes on and it says, that unlike those other high priests, he does, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sin first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once and for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sin. So we see that he is the firstborn of the resurrection. Because you can't offer yourself as a sacrifice, but then afterwards be interceding for the people unless you're alive again. And we talked about the set Passover. We talked about the Feast of First Fruits and how this depicts the resurrection. We went to 1 Corinthians 15. Remember 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. And then we see lastly, his third row. He is king. It says that he is the ruler of all. Psalm 72, 11 says, all kings will bow before him. All nations will serve him. Zechariah 14, 9, And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day there will be one Lord. His name alone will be worshipped. Philippians 2, 10 to 12, At the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we'll see in Revelation 19, it says that he comes riding on a white horse and he has the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords as his title. And as I was reading this, I was like, oh, wow. So Dwight Schrute's a liar then because he said he was the King of Kings. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, I was like, uh-uh. We see Jesus is the King of Kings. And we see why is he the King of Kings? Read Psalm 2. Psalm 2 will tell you why he is the King of Kings because he sits on the throne of God. He doesn't sit on the throne of man. He sits on the throne of God. Daniel 7, 13 to 14 says, As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. 
He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that the people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. So we see that Jesus Christ is king. And he loves us. And if you go back to the Greek of that word loves us, it's a present tense. It's a love that continues even today. No matter what you've done, if you are a believer in Christ, he forgives you. He loves you. And he is constantly there. You cannot do anything that will escape his love. You can't. We also see when we look at that word for freed, it speaks of an act with future consequences. So it goes back again to that idea. He's freed you from your sin, not just from the moment you gave your life to him and the past, but he frees you from the past, present, and future sins. Continual consequences. And we see that this is his heart. We go back to Isaiah. Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now, let us settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. And you want to know that that's his heart? Go back to the garden. Go back to that very moment when we fell. And who's the one that properly covers the man and the woman? It is God. So we see his heart. We see his heart for us. He loves us. We see the whole scriptures point to that love. You know, it's been said that this Bible, this book, it's nothing but a love letter from God. And as I mentioned, you look at the garden story. You look throughout the whole Old Testament. You look at all the sacrifices. They point to the Lamb of God. To this Jesus Christ who takes away the sin. Whose precious blood cleanses us and welcomes us into a kingdom of priesthood. And so we see two things there. We are now in his kingdom. And when you read the scriptures, we see that the people were hungry for the kingdom of God. They didn't fully understand that or grasp it. They thought it was going to be physically there right away. We see John the Baptist. He gets arrested and he, he um, sends his apostles. And he's like, hey, go ask him, are you the one? You know, is he going to come and set me free? Is he going to set everything or what's going on? We see the apostles constantly kept asking him, so when are you going to take the throne? There was a hunger for the kingdom of God. But we see that the kingdom of God will be here on earth physically, but not until after everything. After this whole tribulation we talk about, we'll see the kingdom of the Lord come to the earth. But we see for now, though, it's a spiritual kingdom where he reigns in our hearts. He is the king of our hearts. We see in Colossians 1.13, he says, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. Do you guys remember the first sermon of Jesus? What were the first words of Jesus? He says, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. His kingdom has come. And when we accept him as Lord and Savior, we enter that kingdom now as priests. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, he says, But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. And he's just talking about the people of the world. When he goes on, he says, You are not like that. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people. But now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. So it's there once again. Grace and peace. Because of what he's done. And so we're called to be priests. And if we look at the Old Testament, what did a priest do? Because he's not talking to be priests like in the sense of like a Babylonian pagan idol priest or a Catholic priest. He's talking about the temple priests. And what would a priest do? And the priest's job was simple. He had a twofold job. He interceded for the people to God. He would go before God and intercede for the people. And then he would turn around and he would speak to the people from God. That is essentially what the priest did. But look at how the priest dressed. The priest used to wear a turban, and in that turban it had a saying. 
and it said, Holiness of God. And so it depicted this lifestyle that you were set apart as a priest to live a holy life for God. We see that they used to wear a breastplate over their heart with the names of Israel and over the shoulders because the priest intercedes for the people and the priest loves the people. And that is how we apply tonight's message to our daily lives, you guys. As believers, that is how we apply this tonight. We intercede for those around us and we love them. We proclaim to them the word of Jesus Christ. Because the judgment is coming. And it's not to scare anyone. It's not to be that guy like, oh, you know, brimstone and fire. It's just, it is what it is. But we're called to be a priesthood. We're called to love and we're called to intercede. That is the life of the believer. We carry them on our shoulders and we carry them on our hearts. If we could put down our, our life and sum it up in one sentence, this is the life of every believer. It's simply, follow me as I follow Christ. That should be the goal of each and every one of our lives that is here. And we see that the time is now because we look at the next verse. We look at verse 7 and what does verse 7 say? It says, look, he comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. We do it because he's coming back. There's an urgency. And we see that he's coming in the clouds as the Lion of Judah, no longer as that lamb. He is coming back as the judging and conquering king. So we proclaim his word so that others will be spared of this. We just read it in Daniel. All authority is going to be given to him and he's going to come down with that authority. We read, if you look at the Gospels in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Mark 14, and Luke 21, Jesus speaks in every one of these chapters of him coming in the clouds and he uses that title again from Daniel. The Son of Man will come down in the clouds. The testimony of the angels we talked about. The angels themselves said, men of Galilee, why are you guys looking up? You know, this Jesus is going to come down the same way through the clouds. So we see that he is coming back and we see the reaction then of those left behind. We see that it says that they will mourn. The Jew will mourn because they're going to essentially look at him and be like, we messed up. We messed up. We completely denied our Messiah. We see in Zechariah, it tells us in Zechariah 12.10, then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the family of David and on the people of Jerusalem. They will look on me whom they have pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. They will grieve bitterly for him as for a firstborn who has died. So as I was reading this, I've never had a son or a daughter die. I don't know that pain. And, and this is going to be funny because it comes nowhere near. But I've had a dog die. And it's not nice. It's a horrible feeling. And that's the closest that I've come to having a child. But it is not a nice feeling. You know, you don't sleep. You don't eat. It's just, it feels really bad. So I can't even fathom what the loss of a child is. But it says that they will look at Christ. And that is the pain that they're going to feel. Because Jews hate Jesus, you guys. It's, it's so crazy. I'll watch videos on YouTube sometimes of people going and ministering in Israel. And I've mentioned before, there's no curse word, right, in Hebrew? Well, I just found out that there is. But it's not a curse word. You know how, like, we have the F word, which is a specific word, that's a curse word. No, what they do is they've turned the name into a curse word. They took simply taken out the last letter of it, which brings shame to it. And whenever you want to call someone an idiot, whenever you want to call somebody cursed, you want to call them stupid. You want to call them a blasphemer. You call them Yeshu, which is Jesus. Is essentially what they turn his name into. So this is why they're going to see him and they're going to mourn. They're going to be like, we messed up. He was there all along and we messed up. And we see the world's going to mourn, not because they're sorry, but because they're caught. They're going to be like, oh, crud. It's time. Uh, he's here. And so we see the reaction of the world. And we see lastly, the verse, our last verse for tonight. We see verse 8, you guys. 
And verse 8 says, now, the reply of Christ. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, who is still to come, the Almighty One. So now we notice the same description for the Father used now of the Son. And we see that, that I am, and we see that description of the beginning and the end. Not saying that the Father and the Son are the same, but they are God, and they are of the same essence. And we read in Isaiah 41.4, it tells us that there is only one. Who has done such mighty deeds, summoning each new generation from the beginning of time? It is I, the Lord, the first and the last. I alone am he. Isaiah 44.6, this is what the Lord says, Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord of heaven's armies. I'm the first and the last. There is no other God but me. So we see tonight as we end, we end on this note of Jesus Christ, the Almighty, the ruler of everything, the omnipotent one with no limits. And so we see this reality that because he is the Almighty one, his word will come true. Nothing can stop his word. He said he's coming back. He's going to come back. So I want to close you guys with these two questions for us tonight. The first one is simple. We've only done eight verses in the whole book of Revelation. Think about this. Eight verses in the whole book. Yet what have we learned so far? We've learned so much, you guys. It's so crazy. What have we learned? Start as we've learned Christ. This whole message, this whole thing, it's about Christ. We see he is the source of revelation. Verse 1. He is the testimony of God. Verse 2. He is the faithful witness, firstborn of the dead, ruler of kings. Verse 5. He is the one who loves us, died for us, and cleanses us. Verse 6. And he is the coming king. Verse 7. So the second question, then knowing this, knowing this about Christ, the second question then is this. What does then this reveal about me? If he is God Almighty who cleanses me, who washes me, who died for me, who loves me, then what does that say about me? What does that say who I am as a believer in Christ? Who am I as a child of the mighty King? And we saw the answer. We are called a royal priesthood. We are called, we are cleansed, we are sanctified. We are separated, set aside for his work. And something I didn't mention when I was talking about the priest. The priest got anointed by blood and oil. You would put the blood on their ear, on their thumb, and on their big toe. And we see that picture of the blood of Christ and the anointing of the Spirit. And we see that in us. We see we are washed by his blood. And then the Spirit baptizes us to equip us for ministry. Each and every one here is called into ministry. And as we've talked about this before, ministry doesn't mean pastorhood. Ministry simply means your life as a believer. So we see that we're washed by His blood, we're equipped by His Spirit for what? To be a priest. To love others, right? We carry them in our heart and to intercede for others. We carry them on our shoulders. And we proclaim his light to this dying world. So why don't we go ahead and bow our heads. And then we'll have Bruce come up and close us out. So Father in heaven, Lord, as we just come before you, we want to give you all things. We want to give you all praise, Lord God. And Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, for what you've done. We acknowledge that you are Lord of lords. King of kings, Lord. And we just ask that you help us to go beyond the light show to go beyond the beach balls, to go beyond all that, and to simply see you. I pray, Lord, that our heart is for worship and the worship of who you are, Lord. That we know you, that we praise you, and that we give you the honor that you deserve as our Lord and as our King. And I just pray for each and every individual here tonight, Lord Jesus. I pray that as they walk in their priesthood, Lord, that you continue to reveal your heart to them, that you continue to allow them instances of interceding for others and of loving others. So Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we ask that you go before us in Jesus' name. Amen. So as Bruce comes up, you guys, I got two quick things to say. So as Bruce said, we got Julia's birthday and then Tuesday we had Jonathan's birthday. 
So we have cupcakes in the back for the celebration. And also, I have notes because last week a bunch of you had questions. So I have notes if you guys want notes of pretty much everything we went over tonight. All right, so. Wow, oh, cupcakes. I didn't know about the cupcakes. Nobody tells me anything around this joint. Cupcakes. Wow. That's wonderful. I've asked the uh, band to come up and close us with one more song. Um, there's a couple things that, that come to my mind. It's, it's, it's just the, the saddest thing of all sad things that I, and I want to, I, I don't, in my humble opinion, for the vast majority of, of believers, Jesus just kind of isn't enough. And you can see that in the, the way church goes and the topics that are discussed and the things that are prioritized. And, you know, come Easter time, everything is suddenly about Jesus. But the rest of the year, it's about all sorts of other things. It's very sad. It's very, very, very sad. Uh, one time... Um, you know, uh, how do I explain this? I was asked to, to do a Christian talk show. Julia, I'm going to close pretty quickly. I've asked Julia to come up and pray. And uh, it was a Christian talk show that I had been on a couple of times. And my agent, uh, she was on the phone with them, and they said to her, that said to her, uh, well, what's Bruce going to talk about? And she, she said, Jesus. That's what he always talks about. And this Christian talk show, which I'm not going to share the name because you would know the name. Their response was, well, that's what he talked about last time. Give us a call when he has something different and new to talk about. What else is there? Truly, at the end of the day, what else is there to talk about? It's all about him. It's all about him. The other thing I wanted to share is there's this scripture. Where's uh, the teacher? I can't remember. I don't know where this scripture is, where it talks about taking every thought captive that competes with the knowledge of Christ. Do you know where that scripture is? It's in one of Paul's letters. I was gonna say one of Paul's letters, but yeah. you can look it up, you know. But it talks about taking every thought captive that competes with your knowledge of Jesus. Now, for all of us, we have a billion thoughts a day <laughs> that compete with the knowledge of Jesus. I'm going to guess pretty much every time you look at your Instagram page, you're bombarded with things that compete with the knowledge of Jesus. Every time you turn on TV, most times when you're talking to friends, and so you're just constantly assaulted with what competes with your knowledge of Jesus, with what he's planted in your heart. And as young people who take your lives very, very seriously. And this is a challenging thing to do. I mean, there's very few people that even try to do this, is, is to recognize that assault, to recognize the things that compete with, your, with the Jesus inside of you. And take it captive. Stop it. Stop it dead in its tracks. Turn off that channel. Don't reply to that text message. Tell that friend, no, I can't hang out with you anymore. It takes courage. You've got to be strong. Sometimes you end up alone on a Saturday night. But 
the end of the day, it's you and him. I just want to encourage you to be courageous in your choices, to be courageous in what you invest in, to take your, your own life seriously enough to, to sometimes use the most powerful word in the language, no. It's the most powerful word in every language, no. That guy comes around <laughs> and you just know as tough as it can be sometimes, just say no. That girl comes around, <laughs> and it's just like, nah, you know? As tough as it can be sometimes, just say no. That friend who always drags you down. That friend that you always come home and you just feel beat up because all they do is gossip and this and that or whatever. You gotta be courageous enough to just say no. Take those things captive so that you can live in the fullness of everything he has for you. Okay? Okay. I've asked Miss Julia to pray, but uh, I think I'll cut the band loose to sing before, uh, before we do. Go for it, guys. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Instagram at We Are Oikos.